Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy B. Wilson. Oh, Tracy, how many times have we talked about the Voynich Manuscript? So many. A kajillion. Is that a number? It is today. Uh, (laughs) People often seem to think they've cracked it. That happens pretty regularly. So in addition to the episode specifically about the Voynich Manuscript that we've done, uh, it has come up on Unearthed many times. But, uh, of course, those have never turned out to actually be anyone decoding the cipher. But the man for whom the manuscript is named has his own fascinating story, which I have always been really into exploring and finally decided it was time. Uh, And as you probably know, if you've listened to our other episodes about the Voynich Manuscript or have studied it even passingly or like read an article somewhere, you know that it was named for the rare book dealer who brought it into the public eye in the early 1900s. And Voynich's path to that career is pretty circuitous. It's kind of interesting. Um, I I want to just talk about his life because he was, in his own right, a very interesting person. But we're not going to talk about the manuscript a whole lot today just to give everyone a, a, a level set. I don't want anyone to think that we're going to delve into the many attempts to decode it. Um, it obviously comes up because it does become somewhat important to his life story. Uh, But we've covered that elsewhere. So today, we are just talking about Wilfred Voynich's life. Voynich was born Mikkel Habdak Voynich in what is now Telshe, Lithuania. He was born October 31st, 1865. Voynich's family was Polish nobility, according to his accounts, although his father worked in a low-level government job. And this is a good time as any to just go ahead and get it out there that what we know about Voynich's early life is largely unsubstantiated, which I feel like is kind of a theme recently. Uh, (laughs) This comes from his own accounts, which are really not consistent if you compare what he told to different people. Yeah, we've talked about that happening on the show before. That's not necessarily a nefarious thing. People, as their lives go on, their stories may shift a little. They don't even realize they're doing it. It's not a conscious effort to deceive, um, but it just happens. And some of this, too, is like what he told his wife later on and then she relayed. So it's all pretty, like we're third hand at that point. <laughs> uh, but we do know that after attending school in Savalki, Poland, his university studies were done in a number of different places. He took college courses at universities in Warsaw, St. Petersburg, and Moscow. And Moscow is where he completed his schooling, and he graduated with a degree in chemistry. And while he became a licensed pharmacist as a result of this education, his real interest at this point in his life lay in politics. During the last 30 years of the 18th century, Russia, Prussia, and Austria had carved up what had been Poland into territories that were governed by each of these countries. This was called the Partitions of Poland. Poland as a self-governing state had ceased to exist during all of this. In 1815, Russian Tsar Alexander I expanded Russia's footprint into what had been Poland, gaining more land than had originally been apportioned, uh, taking control of that under the control of the Tsar. Polish resistance to Russian rule had been happening in various forms throughout the 19th century. Yeah, that is a whole story in and of itself that would be cool to get into at one point. But for Voynich, uh, when he was 20, he moved back to Warsaw. And there, he joined the proletariat party that had been started by socialist revolutionary Ludwig Varinsky, who was imprisoned at that point in awaiting trial. This was 1885. In early 1886, socialist revolutionaries Peter Bardovsky and Stanislav Kunicki were awaiting execution at the Warsaw Citadel. This was a prison complex that had been built by Tsar Nicholas I in the 1830s. Voynich, along with other activists, was part of a plan to try to free them from that citadel. That effort was betrayed, though. Police had placed a mole in the revolutionary group, and Voynich and his co-conspirators were arrested. Wilfred Voynich was incarcerated in the citadel and placed in solitary confinement. His colleagues were all executed over a period of time. And the story goes that seeing one of his friends shot to death motivated him to find a way out. And he did manage to escape, although the details about that are uh, a little bit bare. It's possible as well that he may have been saved from execution during this incarceration because of the high standing of his family. But 
That also is unclear. Whether he was nobility or not, he did get tuberculosis while he was in prison and became quite ill. That affected his health and his posture specifically for the rest of his life. It prevented him from ever standing up straight. After he got out of the Warsaw Citadel, Voynich didn't flee the country. Instead, he kept working with revolutionary groups to fight against Russian rule of Poland. And this resulted in another arrest. And this time, after another 18 months in the Citadel, he was sent to Siberia to work in a salt mine as his sentence. Uh, while he was in Siberia, he met a family by the name of Karloff, who were sympathetic to the revolutionary cause. And the Karloffs encouraged Voynich to escape and to get away from Russia entirely. The advice they gave him was to go to London. At that point, the revolutionary Sergei Stepniak had already fled to England, and they gave Voynich his address, as well as the name of another contact in London, Lily Boole, with a request that he contact Miss Boole and relay their regards to her. Voynich took this urging to heart. He had tried to escape the salt mine twice without being successful, on his third attempt, though, he was successful, and he escaped on June 12, 1890. Several months later, on October 5th, he was in London, and to get there, he had first moved west until he got to Hamburg, Germany. He had gone under disguise as he went. In Hamburg, he had sold what little he had, which included his coat and his glasses, to get enough money for food and a ticket on a cargo ship that was headed to England. There is another version of this story that is hilarious and has since been discounted where he goes the opposite direction and ends up on this wild adventure for a long time. Um, <laughs> but it's really pretty straightforward. He just tried to take the shortest route possible to London. But even once he got to London, things were kind of rough going. He was pretty gifted at picking up languages, but he did not speak English yet at this point. He also had no money. He was malnourished. He had been on a boat at this point for a while. He had a piece of paper with an address on it. But he didn't know the city at all to find that address. So he just started showing that piece of paper with the address to people on the street. And eventually, he had the good fortune to show it to a student who spoke a little bit of Russian. And that young man helped him find his way to Sergius Stepniak's residence. According to Stepniak's account, he opened his door to find this young man who looked just awful. He was grimy and exhausted. Voynich explained that he was a Pole who had fled Siberia. And in connecting with Stepniak, Voynich was joining an already established group of expatriates in London who had all left Russian-ruled Poland. Voynich didn't use his real name when he first got to London. Instead, he went by Ivan Kliczewski. This... Name change was not so much to protect himself, but actually to protect his family. His parents and his sister still lived back home. And when Wilfred had escaped, it was during a prisoner transfer, and he had been confused with another prisoner who had gotten killed while he was also trying to escape. So Voynich was reported as being dead, which kind of made things very smooth for him to be able to vanish from the country. But if word got out that he was, in fact, alive and had joined up with revolutionaries in England, his family back home would have been endangered. Along with Stepniak and his circle, Voynich continued his dedication to the cause. Immediately, the day after he got to London, Voynich is said to have been handing out anti-Tsarist literature in the city. Stepniak's circle of friends, including Voynich, set up the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom, and under that umbrella, the Russian Free Press Fund in 1891. This was an initiative that paid for translation and distribution of propaganda back in Russia, as well as a monthly newsletter titled Free Russia in England. Voynich left the project several years later because he wanted to have a greater say and influence in the revolutionary message that they were promoting, but he didn't get it. He started his own version of the group, which was the Booksellers Union, shortly thereafter. But that really never got off the ground. And we're going to talk about that woman that was mentioned to Voynich when he was still in Siberia, Lily Boole. We're going to do that in just a moment, but first we're going to pause for a sponsor break. So in Stepniak's circle of friends in London was the young woman Voynich had been asked to look up when he got there, Lily Boole. Lily's full name was Ethel Lillian Boole. She was born in Ireland to English parents. As a consequence, you will sometimes see her listed as Irish and sometimes listed as English. <laughs> um, there is a, also a really fun connection here with Ethel Boole for any math buffs in the crowd. 
Her father was George Boole, for whom Boolean algebra is named. Ethel's father died when she was still a baby, and her childhood was not especially pleasant. Her mother had to raise Ethel and her sister on a really tiny pension. Then she got a bacterial skin infection and had to go live with her older brother on the coast for the sake of her health. She was really miserable there. When she turned 18, she gained access to her inheritance and in the process also gained the freedom to do as she pleased. And Ethel first met up with Russian revolutionaries when she was studying music in Germany. And she was drawn to their cause, so when she got home to London, she wanted to learn Russian. And her tutor was exiled Pole Sergius Stepniak, and he encouraged her to spend some time in Russia and learn about it, which she did. She stayed with Stepniak's sister while she was there, and that is how she came to be connected to this whole group that Voynich had also joined up with. Ethel was multilingual, and she actually translated a lot of Stepniak's writing into English for distribution in England. The story goes that when Voynich first saw Ethel, he asked her if she had been in Warsaw in 1887, which she had, to visit the Citadel as part of an effort on her part to learn about what was going on in Warsaw under Russian rule. Voynich said that he had been incarcerated at the time and had seen her outside that day from a window. That may have been true, maybe not. Either way, very romantic idea. It is. One thing that always comes up when you read descriptions of Wilfred Voynich is that he was incredibly... um, charming and sort of magnetic and could really connect with people. And I love the fact that he would have at this point still been kind of a mess. He had just arrived in London, yet he saw this young woman that he thought was pretty and managed to turn on the charm instantly. (laughs) It's like, I haven't eaten a good meal in weeks, but hi, were you in Warsaw in 1887? (laughs) Um, By the time Voynich left the Russian Free Press Fund and the rest of Stepniak's circle, he and Lily had actually become a couple. They were living as husband and wife as early as 1892. He had actually written to a friend in New York to tell him that he was married. Lily had started to go by the initials ELV in correspondence, having taken the name Voynich, although the two of them were not legally married at the time. They were married by deed poll, sort of a unilaterally binding agreement. It's not an actual marriage certificate. Yeah, it's kind of a workaround. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) Ethel simply changed her name to make it less stigmatized for the two of them to be living together. They lived with Ethel's mother for several years, and a few years into the relationship, their involvement with the revolutionary cause came to a close after Sergius Stepniak was struck by a train and killed. There was, during this time, a romantic rival in the picture, though. The Voynichs met a man in the 1890s who at the time was going by the name Sigismund Rosenblum. He would later become more well-known as Sidney Riley. And for more than a century, there was this rumor that Ethel and Sidney began an affair and traveled to Italy together, where he eventually left her in Florence. The story from Ethel's side was that she had gone to Italy to write, and she did indeed turn out a novel titled The Gadfly in 1897 based on the work she had done there. That became a very, very popular novel and eventually also a film and a stage play. Riley later claimed that The Gadfly was based on his life and that he had told Ethel his life story during their time together in Italy. This rumor gained a level of substantiation in recent years when a book about the Bull family written by Jerry Kennedy included information that the affair was corroborated, that happening by two members of British intelligence, George Hill and Sir Paul Dukes. The reason British intelligence agents were the ones who could confirm it was that Sidney Riley was a double agent who came to be known as the Ace of Spies. So, yes, that could be a whole other episode. (laughs) Whether he had purposely initiated his relationship with Ethel to see what political efforts she and her husband might be involved in, or if their affair was incidental, that's really unclear. Yeah, he uh, he at one point, I believe, had mentioned like having, starting this affair when he was in London, and then them meeting up in Italy, but he was kind of bored by that point. But I don't, it's unclear whether or not that was because he had realized they were not involved in any revolutionary cause anymore or if he had just legitimately been romantically interested in her and then kind of was not anymore. But while they were living in London, Voynich had also become friends with a man named Richard Garnett, who worked at the British Museum Library as the keeper of printed books. 
Garnett had suggested that a career in antiquarian books would be a perfect path for Voynich, advising him that he just needed to travel and acquire such volumes and then return home and sell them to buyers in London. And Voynich actually found this to be a pretty appealing idea. The first rare book catalog that Voynich produced, along with a partner named Charles Edgel, came out in 1898, and this contained a fair number of incunabula. These are books that were printed before 1500. And it also made use of proctor numbers, which had just been introduced that year in the book Index to the Early Printed Books in the British Museum from the Invention of Printing to the Year MD, with notes to those in the Bodleian Library. So proctor numbers were created by bibliographer and author of the book we just mentioned, Robert Proctor, working, as the title says, with the collection of the British Museum. And this cataloging system is pretty interesting because it classifies pre-1500 books by the printer that printed them, as well as the physical location of their printing and the countries where printing had been established. So this creates this really unique chronological history of printing and its spread, as well as notating the specific title at hand. This kind of became the gold standard for identifying incunabula. And embracing this system, Voynich was establishing himself as someone who didn't just sell rare books, but really cared about their provenance and their place in publishing history. The next step in Voynich's rare books career was the opening of his shop in Soho Square. More carefully annotated catalogs followed, and Voynich started including a section for books that were, quote, unknown, lost, or undescribed. What he meant was books that weren't in any known bibliography and had no record of having been part of any library's collection. And since Voynich was urged into this career by Richard Garnett, it is probably no surprise that one of his primary clients was the British Museum. Over the years, the British Museum bought 3,800 books from Wilfred Voynich, and he was able to make a pretty nice living traveling around Europe, particularly to convents and monasteries, and acquiring valuable pieces from their collection, and then selling them to not just the British Museum, but other museums and occasional private collectors in London. He was not, by most accounts, entirely fair when he made some of these business deals. He was often trading modern books of little to no value, in exchange for books that he knew were valuable because of their age, condition, and rarity. In some cases, though, I think it's worth noting that these were in collections where he was like, I know you're not comfortable handling this book because it is old. I will give you a copy that is essentially the same content that you can just thumb through whenever and is a little more sturdy. And in exchange, you give me the rare, beautiful one. They were getting a useful book, but it wasn't valuable. (laughs) That's better than how I had interpreted this, was, which was that he was just sort of... A weasel? Bilking people of their <laughs> rare books with inferior substitutes. Uh, there are, depending on what uh, account you read, you will get everywhere on the spectrum and every flavor of nuance regarding people's assessment of those deals. So these unknown, lost, or undescribed books became very popular with these buyers, so much so that when he produced the eighth catalog in June of 1902, this consisted only of unknown books. The British Museum made Voynich an offer to purchase the entire catalog for the sum of 800 pounds. That was a large offer, but Voynich wanted twice as much, but also he wanted the books to go to the museum. Yeah, he did seem to have a vested interest in making sure these books got put into museums so they would be cared for. And this is where he pulled off what, to me, reads like a fairly epic business deal. Voynich, knowing the British Museum would not meet his quote, reached out to a number of the private collectors that he did business with, and he made the suggestion to them that they could purchase the books at his asking price, of course, and then donate them to the British Museum so they would be preserved and cared for. This completely worked. (laughs) So the museum got their books. Voynich got the price he wanted for them. These collectors got to feel like they were contributing important things to the museum. Theoretically, everybody wins. It's another one of those cases where there's a little nuance in the mix about how much of this was strictly for self-benefit and how much of it was, no, this really is the best solution for all of us. In 1902, Voynich formally married Ethel Lillian Boole, although they had been living as spouses for a decade at that point. Ethel had changed her name, but they had never actually married. 
He had also been going by the anglicized version of his name, Wilfred Michael Voynich, for years, but it didn't legally become his name until two years later when he changed it at the same time as he became a naturalized British subject. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, more about Voynich's rare book business in just a moment, including when he finds the Voynich manuscript. But right now we're going to take a quick break and hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. So in the early 1900s, business was going really, really well for Wilfred Voynich. And in 1908, he expanded his enterprise by acquiring an already established shop in Florence known for its amazing collection of incunabula. He made a catalog of the books available in the Florence location titled A Catalog of Rare Books, printed in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, not to be found in the British Museum. He also upgraded his London location at this time to a new shop on Shaftesbury Avenue. The end of the first decade of the 20th century marked a shift in Voynich's focus as well, and a refinement of how he looked for interesting finds. He started to pursue and sell illuminated manuscripts rather than just pieces that were produced on presses, and he started examining bindings of books to see if there were any treasures tucked inside, something we've mentioned happening on previous episodes of the show, particularly previous installments of Unearthed. In 1912, Voynich sold an illuminated manuscript for Augustine's City of God for 1,200 pounds. This was a significant deal. By modern estimates, which of course are always a little bit wobbly when you're trying to do currency conversion, that would be about 138,000 pounds today or $183,000. So he was starting to do some really substantial deals. But Voynich was also not particularly liquid in his assets. And as his interests had shifted to more and more valuable pieces, he was often making a lot of these deals of acquiring them on credit. And he became a little bit infamous for letting accounts lag for years sometimes. 1912 was an important year for Wilfred Voynich. That was the year he gained possession of the manuscript that made his name famous. He wrote about this acquisition, quote, During one of my periodic visits to the continent of Europe, I came across a most remarkable collection of precious illuminated manuscripts. For many decades, these volumes had laid buried in the chest in which I found them in an ancient castle in southern Europe. While examining the manuscripts with a view to the acquisition of at least part of the collection, my attention was especially drawn by one volume. It was such an ugly duckling compared with the others that my interest was aroused at once. I found that it was entirely written in cipher. Even a necessarily brief examination of the vellum upon which it was written, the calligraphy, the drawings, and the pigments suggested to me as the date of its origin the latter part of the 13th century. Uh, that castle was Villa Mondragoni, Frascati, which is not far from Rome, but that information did not come to light for decades. No, he kept the location secret. Um, so did Ethel. <laughs> Uh, there were, we should mention, some items and deals that Voynich was involved with when he was still living in London that kind of went a little bit fishy upon closer inspection. Uh, so we're backtracking a little bit. But in 1905, he acquired a painted parchment from another dealer in England. And that English dealer had said that the art painted on it depicted Columbus arriving in the Americas. But there was a flag in that painting that just didn't match up with the description. It was something that wouldn't have existed until later. And whether Voynich or someone who worked for him identified this out-of-time flag and this problem with the timeline, we don't know. But they did still think it was an old piece. And so using that info, they came to the conclusion that it might be a painting of Cortez arriving in Mexico. Voynich sold this parchment to the British Museum, apparently genuinely believing that it was legitimate, just misdated, but the museum asked for more details, and it could only be conclusively traced to the dealer who had sold it to the dealer that Voynich had bought it from. Years after Wilfred Voynich died, it was determined to be a forgery. That whole forgery story is also another <laughs> potential story of its own. Uh, as the First World War was beginning in Europe, of course, Wilfred Voynich stopped traveling, and he turned his attention from the European continent across the Atlantic. 
He made a trip to New York City, sailing on the Lusitania in the fall of 1914. And this was the first of several trips, because he had found an entirely new group of buyers in the United States. After initially working out of his hotels where he was staying, which was often um, the Waldorf Astoria, he finally set up an office for himself on West 42nd Street, which is right across from Bryant Park. Starting in early 1915, Voynich had started moving a lot of his most valuable stock to New York, and eventually North America became home to his primary office. He hired a woman named Ann M. Nill to serve as his assistant and to help manage his New York business. He kept the shop in London, which was left in the care of Herbert Garland to manage. Ethel joined her husband permanently in New York in the early 1920s. One of the new business practices that Wilfred Voynich started in the U.S. was mounting exhibitions in various cities. So he would arrange to have some of his most striking illuminated manuscripts of the collection displayed. And this was a way to drum up interest and also make sales. He could, you know, have (laughs) have people come in. It was almost like a gallery. And he would do this at venues in Manhattan, as well as at Princeton, at the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, and in Buffalo at the Albright Gallery. Wilfred showed the cipher manuscript at one of these exhibits, and he did want to sell it, but was also just fascinated by it like so many people are today. But that led to a little bit of a problem. Two different people reported Wilfred Voynich to the U.S. Bureau of Investigation as a possible enemy working within the United States, citing the manuscript as possible evidence. This, of course, was the precursor to the FBI. The first man that reported him was W.S. Booth. He wrote a letter to the Department of Justice, which is kind of wishy-washy on whether he actually thinks Voynich may be up to something. He opens his letter with, Dear Sirs, I have no reason to suppose that Mr. W. M. Voynich is not solely occupied with his book selling, but the enclosed letter from him to me may be worth a moment's consideration in view of your reported difficulties with spies. So the enclosed letter was one that Voynich had written to Booth, who he knew through his academic contacts. He had sent copies of the manuscript to. In this letter, Voynich mentioned the Bacon cipher, Voynich believed it to be the work of Franciscan friar Roger Bacon, who lived in the 13th century. And Voynich mentioned that the, quote, War Department is working on the subject, and I hope they will be able to transliterate it with the help of their expert readers. It is not clear exactly what this meant, but the Department of Justice did not seem to have done much of anything with this information past sending a reply acknowledging that they did get Mr. Booth's correspondence. Yeah, we don't know why he thought the War Department was working on the Voynich manuscript at this point. Remember, it did not have the um, the reputation that it does now. We don't know if he knew someone in the military who was like, oh, that's interesting, I would love to take a look at it, or if there was actually someone doing it. That's all a little bit curious. There's a scan of this document that is after... Um, <laughs> after a copy of it has been sent to the U.S. government and someone circles that claim and just writes, why, next to it, (laughs) Uh, which I found sort of charming. Um, But because Voynich, who was a stylish and wealthy foreigner, had this strange cipher, rumors started to circulate that his book dealer facade was covering up the fact that he actually had war ciphers from the U.S. military and was possibly selling them to the Germans. This rumor got really spun up when Voynich had dinner with a German-born naturalized U.S. citizen named Walter Lichtenstein. The boring truth was that Lichtenstein was the head of the library at Northwestern University. But word that Voynich had been discussing ciphers with Lichtenstein, who had been born in Germany, made it to the Bureau of Investigation, and they opened a formal file on the book dealer. The investigation was thorough. The people who had rented Voynich his office space were questioned. His bank was visited by the authorities. His rooms were searched, and Voynich himself was questioned by an investigator named A.W. Willett. Voynich showed all of his documents, his passport, his British citizenship papers, and even the Bacon manuscript to Willett. Everyone who was asked about him described him as a lovely gentleman of means. On December 27, 1917, Captain Manley of the Cipher Bureau wrote a report to Lieutenant Strauss, 
which was then relayed to the Bureau of Investigation, and it made matters pretty clear. It started with, quote, There is no ground for suspicion in regard to Mr. Voynich's cipher manuscript. It was written in England over 600 years ago and neither has nor can have the slightest bearing on the present situation. That report goes on to relay how Voynich was interviewed, how he was very clearly not pro-German, and that the conclusion is that a personal grudge must have led Voynich to be reported as a possible insurgent. This file was maintained through 1920, with investigations kicking up any time he traveled or did much of anything at all, really. But it never seems to have resulted in finding anything except for a lot of bureaucratic back and forth. The letters are really funny to read, where it's like, didn't you question this Voynich person? Yes, I did. He's just an antiquarian book dealer, like you said. <laughs> um, it makes me laugh a little bit. So... We mentioned earlier that Ethel did not move to the U.S. until the 1920s. One of the reasons for this was that during the war, she adopted a child, although there was never any legal paperwork or a formal adoption. But that girl, Winifred Eisenhart, was the daughter of a German prisoner of war, and so Ethel, for whatever reason, decided that she would take care of her. Wilfred, we should be clear, was not really ever a father figure to Winifred, though. He wrote to a friend in 1926 about her, quote, I know her very little. I foot the bills, but I am not taking part in her education or bringing her up. ELV loves her, and that is the end of it. Wilfred traveled to England on business in 1929, and he came down with pneumonia while he was there. He was able to get back home to New York, but he never recovered. He had never had great health since his time in prison, and he was also a lifelong smoker. Voynich died on March 19th of 1930, and at that point, he had never sold the Bacon cipher. No, he really did seem to want some academic to please, please solve it, because he was really into it at that point. And after Wilfred's death, Ethel and Anne, who, remember, he had hired as kind of his assistant, she's often listed as a secretary slash manager. Of course, that's some outdated language. But um, the two women continued the business together, and they also became each other's closest companion. They lived together for the next 30 years. They first lived in Brooklyn, and then they moved into Manhattan into an apartment. And they kept things running in the rare book trade that Voynich had established, but neither of them was ever as gifted as Wilfred had been at cultivating relationships with buyers and sellers. Wilfred had left the famous cipher manuscript jointly to Ethel and Anne. He included instructions in his will that they could sell it, but it had to go to a public institution, and the price was firmly set at $100,000. Ethel died in 1960, and Anne became the sole owner she sold it to a private book dealer against those instructions in Wilfred's will, and then Anne died in 1961. Today, Voynich's catalogs of books are prized as collector's items, which probably would have tickled someone who looked for rare books for a living, uh, that his lists of rare books then became considered rare books themselves. The Grolier Club on East 60th Street in Manhattan, which is a book lover society, has a comprehensive Voynich collection documenting the antiquarian bookseller's time in New York from 1916 on, and they have a complete set of Voynich catalogs. And now, of course, the legacy is that everyone is always trying to decode that thing. And sometimes saying they did it on their lunch break. That always tickles me. (laughs) Um, Yeah, Wilfred Voynich, he's an interesting creature for sure. Mm -hmm. I will will talk in our behind the scenes about one of the many reasons I love him in a strange way. Okay. Uh, It's my own own nostalgia. But first, I have completely unrelated listener mail from our listener, Shannon, who writes about tarot and cats. Uh, She writes, thank you for your awesome episode on the history of tarot. I took up tarot as a moody teenager. Uh, My recently divorced mother took me to a new age bookstore. What did you expect? But my passion in it has skyrocketed during quarantine, both because I needed some sort of outside guidance in these times and also because I'm helping playtest a tarot-based RPG. That sounds amazing. Having a community of other tarot-interested folks to talk over daily card polls, books, and gush over beautiful tarot decks has been one of the highlights of my time at home in this crazy year. I'm attaching some pictures of some of my favorite decks for you to enjoy as well. I said on that episode, I will say it again, the art 
that goes into some of these decks is oh delicious. Um, also, please add me to the list of folks asking for an episode on Pamela Coleman Smith. She says, finally, thank you both for all of your work. I started listening to you both as a history obsessed but theater studying college kid, and ever since, your voices have been a source of calm and joy, no matter what is going on. Here are some pictures of my cats, Aria, Amy, and Aiko, as an additional show of gratitude. Hoping you are staying as well as can be expected, Shannon. Shannon, thank you so much. Um, again, yes, kitties always, but oh, some of this tarot art that she sent is really beautiful and cool. I love it. Um, I I have learned as a consequence of doing that episode, I have a number of friends who kind of similarly got more into tarot during uh, the pandemic, just as kind of a way for them to like learn a new thing that's small and does not require a huge investment. And, like, they associate it, as we talked about on the episode, with, like, this is kind of my daily meditation. It's like a thing I think about, and it, you know, it gives me a moment of focus. I love it. It's fascinating. I, um, uh, since we did that episode, the day that episode came out, my new Edgar Allan Poe tarot deck came. And then I have since acquired one that is based on the work of Guillermo del Toro, which is beautiful. Nice. Um, I barely have opened either of them because I haven't had time, but oh, look at that art. I love art. And the tiny art on cards is a fascinating and a special sort of skill to have, I think. Like the people that can convey the meanings of these cards in this smaller size. It's very cool. Anyway, that is the scoop. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at iheartradio.com. We are also everywhere on social media as Missed in History. And if you would like to subscribe to the podcast, and haven't already, it is easy enough to do so. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs> 